looking for Madeleine Carr, it, it might be listed under Madeleine Hersiger Carr, H-I-R-S-I-G-E-R. -E um, I am a history, or I was until the end of the spring semester, a history professor at TCC, and I have now retired. So I'm really happy. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, um, but my, my real love has always been the history of culture and American culture in particular. So my PhD is in American history and I was really lucky enough to be able to teach not just at TCC, but TCC decided that I would, um, that I should go all the way over to China. <laughs> and so I was teaching in China as well. And for the class that I'm going to be teaching this fall, I started in the springtime and it's called Harlem in the 1920s. Uh, you know, the 1920s are really better known, the decade of the 1920s is better known for how it ended. It was a dark and gloomy Tuesday, and all through the night. No, a dark and gloomy Tuesday, and all through the day, the fortunes were just flying away. In 1935, Arne Bontemps, a writer, he wondered, quote, who knows the tale of the 20s? the years of plenty, the golden legend of the amazing young crowd gathered in Harlem, and they almost succeeded in doing for New York what the pre-Raphaelites did for London. Harlem, above Central Park and within walking distance of Washington Square, it's become a place of the mind, a place of movers and shakers, of black and white talents. And in that decade in Harlem, in the 1920s, these talents reveal much about an intolerant Philistine America. The 1920s were also a tonic, just what the doctor ordered after that long, great war. And I want to tell you that tale so you can understand the years of plenty that ended in such economic disaster. Writing of that era, novelist, Edna Worthley Underwood said, quote, joy, its mainspring, is dying in the great Caucasian race. African Americans, of course, were pretty much excluded because of racism from factories, campuses, offices, and corporations. And so I'm preparing, uh, I'm sorry, and so I'm presenting Harlem in the 1920s to inquire why then the African American was seen as a perfect symbol of cultural innocence and regeneration? On what basis were there opportunities for racial advancement? Or were there? I hope to see many of you next month to tell you the tales and to pursue the quest to understand the 1920s. Thank you. All right, hello everybody. So my name is Heather Gamper. This is semester five for me teaching for Ollie. I taught two classes on honeybees and beekeeping, one class on the mating rituals of birds. So after teaching the Ollie members about the birds and the bees, <laughs> I started uh, teaching a class called The World Redraw Redrawn, the Diversity of Maps. This will be the second semester that I teach this course. In the spring, I launched this course as an extremely sleep-deprived graduate student who was finishing my uh, doctoral dissertation. And to those of you who are in my class, I survived, <laughs> did it successfully. There were a lot of, lots of sweat, but little tears. And so this semester, you'll get somebody who has a little bit more sleep. Um, so we're gonna do it again. So this course is about maps, and I loosely define maps as um, the representation of multi-dimensional space into fewer dimensions. And this is generally done by map makers um, to get large amounts of information to a viewer in maybe what would just be a quick glance. Um, so the way we um, ran the class last semester was that the first, uh, the first um, of three days, we will talk about the many, many different types of maps. Um, these will range from subway maps that are based on putrid smells in New York City 
to the development of a child language in a three-dimensional space being the house. We also look at numerous and very humorous cartograms where uh, units on the map are, are um, enhanced because of their quantity and, and things like that. Then what we do is we launch into one of the most powerful mapping platforms today, Google Earth. And this, this class happens behind a computer. Um, we, will, we will start exploring uh, Google Earth. And then the second day of class, we might continue with Google Earth. And then what we do is we uh, develop a three-dimensional glance through uh, digital cameras. We take a series of pictures outside on, uh, outside on campus, and I'll teach you how to make that into a two-dimensional, somewhat spherical photo or panoramic photo where we will, we will look at those composite pictures. Um, so that was something fun that we did. And then I uh, saved the last class for navigational skills. I take some GPS units from the geography department, and we made a, a small uh, treasure hunt, in a sense, on campus. Last semester, my treasure hunt was not difficult enough, and this time, we're going we're gonna to make it a lot more difficult. Um, the computer skills that you need are very basic. And the way I designed the class is, if you have no computer skills, you really could just sit and watch and be entertained or sit next to somebody who knows what they're doing. But if you know how to copy and paste and you can take pictures with your own digital camera and you know how to download pictures from your camera, then those are considered top-notch skills for this <laughs> class. <laughs> Um, but generally, my goal in the course is to get one to consider how influential space and perhaps time is ha in how we draw the world around us. And so that's pretty much the goal. And if you have any questions, um, you can see me or email me. Okay? All right. Uh, hello. It's good to see you all. My name is Matthew Goff. And I'm a professor in uh, the religion department. I teach classes on uh, the Hebrew Bible, uh, ancient Judaism, uh, Christian origins, and I also teach um, Hebrew and Aramaic. And I'm very glad that, uh, that Ali is uh, here and I, because I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I have the opportunity to teach with you a, a class that I offer, a, a version of a class I teach pretty regularly uh, on, on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, you might know that uh, virtually every uh, museum, the American museum that has them, an exhibition of them, they, they sell out and uh, they break uh, attendance records. Um, and, uh, and there's a great deal of popular interest in these. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls are the greatest uh, archeological discovery of the 20th century. Um, we, the, we have, uh, it's about 930 texts from, um, from, from ancient Judaism. And it's interesting, most of our documents, our, our biblical texts of, uh, um, of, of, ancient Ju of Judaism generally are medieval copies of older documents. We actually don't have that much um, in terms of Judaism or Christianity from the period of antiquity itself. But now we do because of the scrolls. It's amazing that we, we have these. Um, um, like I said, about 930 texts, um, um, uh, uh, retellings of biblical texts, messianic uh, prophecies, uh, the most elaborate account of what the eschatological holy war will look like, like what the, the kinds of trumpets that the angels will have, the, the kinds of swords they'll have. And so when it all comes down, you can look, look surprised if you take this class. <laughs> and um, um, so, so um, um, there's, a, there's a great deal of very, and I guess one of the things I would mention is a lot of this material is from a particular Jewish sect that had been, that they believed that they had been given a, um, they actually used language of a new covenant, that they had been given new revelations about how to follow God and what God likes and what he doesn't like, and in their opinion, there's a lot he didn't like. And, uh, and so the idea that, that uh, um, you had a group that understood themselves to break off from the temple, from mainstream Judaism, and um, to kind of start their own new way. 
in about 100 BCE, kind of early, so, so pre-Christian, but obviously very, very important for Christian origins, gives us a better account of, a, a picture of the Judaism out of which uh, both the Judaism that we know and Christianity emerged. So, and one other thing I'd mention is, is a lot of this material has only been published in the last 15 years. So one, one, th one thing, I, the, the, the last note that I would stress with you is we're in a better position um, now um, to understand the, the Judaism out of which uh, both the Judaism that, that we know and Christianity emerged. We know more about that Judaism now than we did 100 years ago, than we did 50 years ago, and then even 20 years ago. Um, because of the Dead Sea Scrolls, many of which have only been published in the last few years. So I um, invite you to, to um, learn about uh, these scrolls um, in my class, and I'll, I will be around here, and I, I have a, uh, um, a, a few copies of the lecture schedule, and we can talk about what we, what will be, uh, in more detail, what we'll be talking about. So, thank you. I'm Professor Emeritus Bill Hernkind. I'm a marine biologist, at least once was. Um, I'm also the senior scientist in residence at the FSU Marine Laboratory, a sparkling jewel of a place on the edge of the Gulf of Mexico, which is one of the most fascinating marine habitats in the world. We have it right at our footsteps. Um, I'm proud to say that about uh, 28 years ago, 1984, I was instrumental in initiating a program called Saturday at the Sea, and it's for middle school age youngsters, and it's been running continuously ever since that time. Uh, the premise of it is to introduce youngsters to marine life, to the diversity and the connections between them and with the natural environment and the physical environment in which they live. Barb Shoplock, my collaborator, Barb, would you please stand up if you're still here? Yeah. Barb is the present and longtime instructor uh, in the program. Uh, I just look in from the outside every once in a while to check up on her. Uh, she is one of the uh, finest instructors I've ever worked with in my time at Florida State University. So she talked me into getting with her and with uh, Michael Densow, who couldn't be with us today, he's a marine conservationist, to offer the sea around you. And the premise is the same as with the youngsters. We've kind of upgraded things a little bit uh, to, a, shall we say, more mature audience uh, that I see before me. Uh, we will uh, have three lectures. Uh, one will deal with the zoology and the nature of the kinds of creatures that inhabit our sea, right down here. And, and you, you've all walked the beach, and occasionally you come across something alive or freshly dead, and you look at it and you go, which end is the front? <laughs> which is the top? Some of these creatures could come from Mars. They are, in fact, very, very fascinating creatures, and just their very structure is a fascination in itself. So we will talk about that. We'll also uh, talk with, and, and well, am amply uh, visualized by slides and, and so forth, uh, we will also look at the habitats and organisms in relationship to one another. Uh, there's just incredible sophistication of the interconnection between the organisms themselves, some of them very different otherwise, but uh, connected together by predator-prey relationships and energy and many other things which we are fortunate to have insights into, much of which actually was uncovered right down here at the FSU Marine Lab. Then uh, Mike, who is a uh, conservationist, is going to talk about uh, those kinds of issues. Uh, the organisms and the habitats we have down here perform a lot of important ecological services to us, and they are very much worth protecting. All you got to do is think back to the worries we all had, and I suspect that it goes for you as well as me, in 2010 with the oil spill. Thank goodness it didn't affect us directly as yet. So the crowning uh, part of the program will be a field trip uh, on our boats. Uh, we're going to pull a trawl and get to see with your hands on some of the diversity of marine life of these fascinating creatures. And with that, I want to just leave you with a uh, quote from Rachel Carson, who we unabashedly derived our title from. I, I don't have to ask this audience whether you remember Rachel Carson and right, the sea around us. We'd like to uh, leave you with this, something that she said about 
her wanderings at the edge of the sea. Each time that I enter it, I gain some new awareness of its beauty and its deeper meanings, sensing that intricate fabric of life by which one creature is linked with another and each with its surroundings. Okay. I hope that uh, everyone uh, will enjoy these courses. But first of all, before I begin my, uh, my recap on, on the core Big Bend plantations, I want to recognize Nikki Little. Nikki was instrumental in getting three of these plantations for me. Normally speaking, you don't get on these plantations because, <laughs> because they're usually owned by rich people and they don't, like, they don't <laughs> like others coming in on their private space. But at any rate, we have a great program. Um, Barbara said that uh, I had too many notes for two minutes. Well, 10 pages is not long for two minutes. <laughs> so I might be doing a little editing. And I, ho I hope that I get the message across, because Nikki is a long-term resident of Jefferson County. She's active in the Jefferson County Historical Association. She's a long-term antique dealer in, in Jefferson County. And she decorated several uh, plantation houses, rooms and houses, particularly Dixie Plantation. Nikki's retired now, and she, uh, her activity now is, consists primarily of uh, many other things, but one of the big things she does is barrel, barrel racing. She has two daughters that are barrel racers. So she has, and she has a nice spread with a lot of, a lot of horses, uh, ch champion horses there. Now, let me tell you briefly about Big Bend Plantations. It's exciting, isn't it, to know that this one, three or four counties between the uh, Georgia border down to here, until we got to the Scarp, had such rich land that was very good and productive land that just wowed the Europeans when they came here. So um, the first class is going to be at the green industries. I'm going to have two lectures. The first lecture is going to be on the history of Big Bend plantations by a historian uh, for Justin County who is very, very good, excellent speaker. She has excellent visuals. And the second one is going to be on the history of crops and animal production throughout the uh, plantation period. The first day is also going to be a bonus day because there is a major archaeological conference being held in Monticello. And it's called the First Floridians, First Americans Archaeological Conference. Now, the last lecture, it'll be at 3.30. Our class runs from 1 to 3 each Thursday. So you will have time to leave Green Industries. It's a 10-minute drive from there into the Monticello Opera House. The last speaker of the day is going to be uh, a chap who will be speaking on the ancient and historical origins of the Seminoles. Also of interest is that the museum of the Monticello Opera House will have exhibits and displays. So you can, uh, you can see some of the very interesting things that have been collected in that area. I think most, a lot of you probably know that some of the oldest human remains or evidences of human activity are in the uh, deep, a deep hole in the Oscilla River, dating back 14,000 years. Now, the second class is October 11th, and it's going to be at the site of the mission San Pedro y San Pablo de Patali, which is right off of Buck Lake Road from there. And the reason I've selected that one is because it gives you an example of what the first Europeans saw when they came here. They saw this productive land, and you know how rapacious the Europeans were when they came here. First thing they want to do is colonize the uh, natives and take their land, which is essentially what really always happens when you deal with the inferior quote people. But, but the, other, um, the other part of it is we're going to go from San Pedro de, uh, uh, to the site of the martyrs. I don't know whether many of you know that, but in 1704, the British, with their Creek allies, pretty well eliminated all of, the, all of the Spanish missions. And we will go to a, an area that's between, between San Pedro de Pali and the O'Connell site. And actually, as to what, what these mission names were, uh, history hasn't really provided the, the, the finals on that. Um, and, and the reason 
this, this area uh, on the Big Bend uh, it was important because um, it allowed for these uh, Spanish to develop two markets, one in Havana, Cuba, and the other on the east coast of Florida. So they were able to ship down the waterways to the San Marcos. The uh, second, the, the third class is going to be a Dixie Plantation. Dixie Plantation is a beautiful location. It has a very interesting history. We're going to have the plant manager, the plantation manager talk to us. And it is a plantation that is in 100% conservation easement in cooperation with the Suwannee River Water Management District. And it is, uh, it still is active with, uh, with field trials. So we, whether we'll be able to get in the house is not uh, clear at this time. The, uh, the fourth class is a tour of Blackwater Plantation. This is an active working plantation. That's why it was selected. And it's uh, been in the ownership of uh, a couple of different people over the last uh, 50, 60, 70 years. The owner of this plantation is 96. She's a very, very, uh, a very nice lady, and she's going to be providing uh, some re refreshments and a history for handout. The other, and the Brooks County Historical S Society will be there to, to assist. The fifth class is going to be at Honey Lakes Plantation. Honey Lakes Plantation is an old plantation that was reassembled, modernized, and it's a resort and spa. On the property is an 80-acre 80, 80 lake. There's a wedding chapel. There's a lodging. There's horseback riding, quail, and, and turkey, uh, turkey hunting season, and many other amenities. It's a beautiful property, and it's right on the border of uh, Jefferson and, and Madison County. The, fifth, the sixth class is really one of the things I think will wow most people, because this is a piece of property that sits right on the border between the Big Bend and the Flatwoods. The, the, uh, the, ridge will be, well, the ridge that this property is on is the Cody Escarpment. We have the Cody out here on Monroe. But the Cody from here, you look out across the, 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 uh, the Flatwoods, and on a clear day, if we had it still has steam boats. You can see the steam coming off of the boats because it's just a fantastic piece of property. That piece of property is also the location for the the Ayabali, the Concepcion de Ayabali mission. We have an owner of the property who is going to provide artifacts. You know, we're dating back to 1700. And the thing that is very unique about this is that there will be pieces of the bell. Normally, when these, uh, these creeks and the British burnt all these missions, they took, particularly the Indians, because it, it, it was metal, they took these things. But fortunately, parts of the bell were there, and we're going to see that. This piece of property, as I said, sitting on the bluff, you overlook the, uh, the, the, uh, the flat woods, and you get an idea from here of what the Cracker Cowboys had to go through to round up cattle in the first years of the Civil War to provide food for the army and for the people. So there's a tremendous amount of history in this little capsule. And also part of this uh, trip, this visit is going to be, I've engaged the services of a cowboy poet. When you see the cowboy poet, you will say, man, this person is perfectly in tune with the cowboy poetry writing circle in, held each year in Elko, Nevada. Now, I hope I haven't run over too much of my time. Uh, <laughs> But I want to say thank you, and I hope that you will join me on this wonderful opportunity to see history up close and personal. Well, hello. So uh, what brought all of you here today? <laughs> I know the answer for everyone. Your brain. All right. <laughs> Think about it, right? The motivation to come here the ability to make the motor movements to come here, the ability to navigate by the sensory cues around you. Um, and while you're here, the learning that you're doing, that's all happening because of your brain. And so from my perspective, you know, I know the answer for all of you. Uh, so so this, this is, this is who we are. This is every thought we have, every action we plan. 
Uh, and so I'm Rick Heisen. I, I'm uh, director of the program of neuroscience here at F FSU. And we're offering a course called uh, Brain and Behavior. I'm going to be co uh, coordinate this with uh, Dr. Frank Johnson. And we're both in the Department of Psychology. Um, and so we know that it's common knowledge that the brain does all these different functions. What's less common knowledge is exactly how does it do all these tricks. And so what we're hoping to do with this course is to pro provide you with a foundation of how the brain works. Uh, we're going to start off by pretty fundamental structure of the brain. We'll have brains for you to look at uh, from different species um, and kind of get you a feel of the anatomy of the brain and what the, some of these structures might do. Uh, then we're going to go into talking about in, uh, the physiology of the brain. What is it, this electrical activity in the brain that's so important? And how do these cells communicate with each other? Um, from there, we'll go into some of the common behaviors that uh, are important for everyone. So we spend a lot of time with sensory processes, how, how our eyes work, how our ears work, things like that. Um, we'll look into a, a variety of, of these common behaviors of how we control our motor behaviors, et cetera, and uh, looking at how the brain actually works. Now, uh, what we're going to do in this class is talk about how the brain works and also about how, what things can go wrong with the brain, so things related to like neurodegenerative disease and things like that. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to team up on, on you. Um, Dr. Johnson and I are going to coordinate a team of graduate students, and they're, they've put together a whole lot of demonstrations and hands-on learning experiences that they've used in uh, not only in our classrooms here at FSU, but also in a broader outreach program that we go out to the local high schools with. And so they're anxious to bring all these uh, demonstrations and, and hands-on experiences into one setting here and, and present them to you. So hope to see you in Brain Behavior. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name's Marshall Cap. I'm a lawyer. I teach primarily in the College of Medicine, which tells you something right there that I'm kind of <laughs> unusual. Uh, I teach in the law school as well, primarily in the College of Medicine. And so when I think about what my role is, uh, I think about the story of the meeting one day of the physician, the engineer, and the attorney. And they were arguing about which one of them represents the oldest of their professions. So the physician began by saying, look, what was one of the first things that God did after creating the heaven and earth? He took a rib from Adam and he created Eve. Certainly that's medicine. Certainly medicine must be the oldest of our professions. And the engineer said, well, before God did that, God saw that there was total chaos in the universe, total disorder. And out of chaos, God created order. So certainly engineering must be older. And they both looked very expectantly at the attorney. And he said, so who do you think was responsible for all that chaos in the first place? <laughs> so that's, that's kind of my job. And uh, hopefully what we'll do in, in the course that I'm offering is uh, create some chaos, but uh, ideally together move from chaos to understanding. And specifically, uh, in the context of this course, understanding about some of the issues that affect us all as contemporary American healthcare consumers, families of healthcare consumers, and people who pay for healthcare. So the title of my course, which is uh, too long, is Current Legal and Ethical Controversies in American Healthcare. The specific issues we're gonna talk about. Informed consent and shared decision making. How much do you wanna be involved as an individual, patient, or family member in healthcare decision making? What's your ideal of a partnership with your healthcare providers, with your healthcare team? We'll talk about participation in biomedical research. What are your rights as a potential uh, participant in biomedical research? How is biomedical research regulated in a way that protects the people who participate? Talk about public health law. Uh, what are the, uh, the powers and the duties and the limits on powers of government to protect and promote the public health? If you lived in New York City, can Mayor Bloomberg really tell you what size soft drink you can drink? And where does, where does that legal authority come from? Does, does he have the authority to do that? Talk about end of life, medical planning, advanced directives, and that sort of thing. 
talk about the medical malpractice system. Is our current medical malpractice system the best way to both compensate people who get injured in the course of healthcare and to work toward improving the quality of healthcare? And uh, finally, healthcare reform. Who's going to pay for all this? How are we going to pay for it? Um, so this is not a lecture course. Uh, the way I plan it is each time I will start out with uh, a little bit of background talking at you, and I'll, I'll use PowerPoints and I'll share those with the class before each class session. But the majority of the class session I envision as I'll come in with some cases, some concrete cases, to use as the basis for group discussion so that uh, you all are doing much of the work and each time I'll have a, a guest physician who will join me, a different person each time, uh, to help to facilitate that discussion. So I hope many of you will join me. Thank you. Hello, I'm Karen McGinnis. Um, I'm a biology professor here at Florida State University and I teach plant biology and genetics. So. One of the things that I've noticed um, throughout my career as a scientist and as an educator is that as dependent as we've become on science and technology, we don't always understand it very well. And so one of my goals as a scientist and educator is to help people that aren't scientists understand some of the important issues that they deal with on a daily basis and some of the background for those issues. Um, so as a plant biologist and a geneticist, one of the issues that I think a lot about are um, agricultural issues and specifically crop biotechnology. And so um, I'm going to teach a course entitled Frankenfoods um, and Crop and Modern Agriculture. And I purposely chose a kind of inflammatory title, although I don't intend for the class to be inflammatory at all. So um, I'm not going to present from one particular viewpoint or the other, but just hopefully bring some of the scientific issues to you in a way that's understandable for people who don't have their PhD in the sciences. So I hope that you'll join me. It will be a lecture format um, class with some discussion and maybe some demonstration as well. So thank you. Hello. Um, I'm Claire Mitchell. I am the Sustainable Agriculture Programs Manager at Green Industries. Uh, we're located in Jefferson County. We'll be having our two classes out there, the plantation class and my class, which is Grow and Eat. Um, I grew up not liking vegetables because we ate out of the freezer. And there was a lot of steaming going on and a lot of like margarine and garlic salt, and that was it. Um, so when I got to college, I became vegetarian and eventually became vegan. I'm not vegan anymore. Um, but I learned how to cook vegetables. And now that I'm also a gardener, I know how to grow them as well. So salad has really evolved for more than just iceberg lettuce and croutons and bacon bits. Um, and we're going to talk about, uh, we have five raised beds out at Green Industries. And raised beds are just boxes filled with dirt that make gardening a little bit easier. Uh, at Green Industries, we do the opposite of the plant uh, class that was just described, and we do all sustainable and organic agriculture. Um, and that's the kind of gardening that I teach, so no uh, chemical fertilizers or pesticides, and we use a lot of um, heirloom plants. So uh, you will be with a group. You'll plant a raised bed in a garden style that you all decide on. And then each class we will be preparing some kind of salad. And it will either be a green salad like you would normally think of, or perhaps tabbouleh salad, or perhaps a cooked salad that is now cold. You'll learn how to make salad dressings. You'll learn different kinds of interesting vegetables to put on your salads to wow your guests. Um, so I hope that you will join us. I think it'll be really fun. Thanks. Hi, y'all. You awake? Yeah? OK. You know that's the plural of, never mind. You all, all y'all, it's the plural of you all. Okay. My class is a poetry workshop, so it's not really a class, it's more participatory. We're going to be writing poetry. And uh, Billy Collins says that um, every poet has a larcenous heart. And so one of the things we're gonna do is looking at how to steal from the world what we want to put in our poems. So we'll be working with journals blank books, so I want everyone to have a blank book so you can write down what you hear people say in coffee shops, like, I know her, but I don't know-know her. 
is what I heard someone say yesterday. I thought that was a great line for a poem. Um, and Lorca says that the poet is uh, the professor of the five bodily senses. So we'll also be working on how to steal images all day long from everything we see. Again, you'll be writing them down in your blank book. And uh, I wanted to show you, I did list these two books as books you might want to get your hands on, but you don't have to. One is called The Practice of Poetry, Writing Exercises from Poets Who Teach by Robin Ben and Chase Twitchell. Um, mine is falling apart, I use it so much. And the other one is a newer one called The Mind's Eye, A Guide to Writing Poetry by Kevin Clark. And I use them mostly because they have lots of fun exercises, lots of inventions, and that's one of the things we'll be doing. In each class, I hope to talk a wee bit about technique, form, repetition, rhythm, that sort of thing. And in each class, to be doing invention exercises, hence these cool books that have lots of invention exercises, and to be doing a little bit of writing, a little bit of free writing, and sharing that free writing. Uh, Chase Twitchell says that poetry is the art of surprising yourself with your own thoughts. So what I would like for you to do is spend some time each class surprising yourself by writing something down from one of the exercises and sharing it. And we will also be bringing finished products to the class to, in copies of them to actually workshop with each other. So you can be working on uh, working with an audience, the audience of the people in the class. There are only 18 spots in this class because more than that, you won't have a chance to actually read everyone's poems and workshop everyone's poems. So sign up quickly. And uh, I look forward to working with you all and writing poems with you. Thanks. Hello and welcome. My name is Steve Petrushak. I'm the uh, assistant curator over at the Antarctic Marine Geology Research Facility. I've been working there since about 2007. And Deborah, thank you very much for this opportunity. This will be my first class uh, to teach for Ollie. Uh, I've spent two seasons down on, uh, in the Antarctic uh, as a field geologist. Oh, I'm, yes. Uh, I've spent two seasons down in, in the Antarctic as a field geologist slash curator on an Antarctic drilling uh, program expedition. And in this class, I'd like to go and share some of those experiences of my work and uh, some of the unique things that have happened down there. Uh, also, I we'll be going over uh, the history of our facility here at uh, Florida State University. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about glacial marine uh, 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 sediment transport. You don't have to have any prior geology or oceanography experience. I'll go over all the basics in the class to kind of get you uh, up to speed on all that. What we, I'll go over some of the things that we do at our facility, uh, such as core, core curation, types of cores that we have there, uh, our dr different drilling techniques depending on where we're at. Uh, I'll go over some of the things that we actually do there as far as testing the cores. We do a lot of non-destructive testing to go and take, extract as much information out of the cores as we can, uh, such as x-rays. Uh, we have a multi-sensor core logger that we take certain uh, readings off of. And we do a lot of sampling. And I'll go over some of the different samples that we take and some of the uses that are from these samples. Uh, and one of the big things that we do at our facility is core descriptions. We look at cores, both macro and micro, and we look at those to try to go ahead and give scientists the information they need to go ahead and look at past climate conditions. And using those past climate conditions, they're able to go ahead and forecast what could happen in the future based off what they've seen happen in the past. Uh, and time permitting, depending on what the class size is, I'd like to go ahead and have a couple hands-on uh, activities where you're able to go ahead and make some smear slides just like the scientists do and examine them underneath a microscope take a look at some of the microfossils that give us the, the idea of different uh, climate conditions. And finally, we'll, we'll do an interpretation of the sediment cores, kind of looking at what, inf what all information we can go ahead and gather off those. And we'll, this is going to be three classes at, with one field trip included over to the Antarctic Research Facility. And if you'd like to have some additional information about our facility, you can get that from uh, arf.fsu.edu. Thank you very much. Yeah, our website, and it's actually still under construction, but it'll give you a little bit of idea of some of the information that you know you'll, you could be seeing. It's arf.fsu.edu. I'm shorter. <laughs> My name's Dina Ramsey, and I'm thrilled to be teaching once again this term at Ollie. 
I will be offering three, or Ollie's offering three classes that I'll be teaching. Uh, the first one is going to be Genealogy Geek Online Research Lab. Uh, it will be on Tuesday from 9.30 to 11 a.m. And it's a follow-up to the genealogy, new generation genealogists that we had back in the spring. And we're going to be accessing uh, genealogy websites, databases, and forms. <coughs> Excuse me. And demonstrate how to utilize non-genealogical specific websites for finding that elusive ancestor. The next course I'll be teaching is Digital Photography Workshop. It's also on Tuesdays, but it's from 1.30 to 3 p.m. And we'll learn basic camera operations, photography tips, how to download and organize and enhance, edit and enhance your photos. If you plan to take Heather's class, and I think she left, I was going to give her a little plug. If you're not sure how to use your camera, come to my class first on Tuesday <laughs> and then her class on Wednesday. And then the last class that I'm most excited about um, telling you about is because it's the first time it's ever been offered here at Ollie. It's an iPhone, iPad technology class. Um, it will be a three-part, thank y'all. <laughs> it will be a three-week course from 1.30 to 3.30 on Tuesdays. And we'll begin with the basics and then we'll s discover really useful tips and tricks for covering everything from adjusting your settings, customizing your home screen, using Wi-Fi, AirPrint, um, getting more from built-in apps like Mail and Safari, and much more. If you have any specific questions about what I'll be teaching in the class, I'll be happy to answer after the showcase. Thank you. Hello, my name's Mandy Sauer, and I'm the Executive Director for the Tallahassee Symphony Orchestra. And many of you in here know that we're having a very exciting season. We're having a music director search this year. And our first conductor arrived last night. I've spent the morning with him, and he's very engaging. And I know a lot of you are having lunch with him tomorrow, and you'll really enjoy getting to know him. Um, wanted to say this is the third time I've taught for Ollie. And the first two times, I was teaching music specifically geared for concerts that the, that the symphony was presenting. Um, and this is going to be really fun for me, because this time I get to pick the music that we look at and learn about. Um, the last comment I wanted to make before I give my spiel is that I'm a classical musician, not a jazzer, so I don't improvise. So you have to bear with me while I read. <laughs> um, the course I'm teaching is called Musical Form and Meaning. And there are two kinds of people in the world. There are the kind who enjoy strolling through art museums unencumbered, stopping at a painting when they're inspired to do so, and then allowing the images, colors, and textures on the canvas to speak for themselves. And then there's the kind whose first stop is always at the kiosk where the audio guides that provide background and technical information on the various works in the gallery are available. And those are also the type that go to the information desk to find out when the guided tours are available. There are the kind who enjoy poetry, novels, and plays for the plot line or the sheer beauty of the language. And then there are those who like to dissect, perhaps in a book club or in a post-theater conversation, the structure or symbolism involved in a literary work. There are those who enjoy watching strong, elegant, and graceful bodies uh, inhibit the stage at the ballet, and others who watch for the nuanced variations in movements of the dancers to better understand character development, character development and arc. You get the point. If you're the type who loves audio tours, learning about structure, form, symbolism, meaning, and character development, and you love music, then this is the class for you. In my class, Musical Form and Meaning will dissect how pieces of music are put together and how these techniques reveal a composer's genius and intent, both psychological and emotional. So the three large sections are, we'll first spend a couple weeks looking specific, specifically at what we call polyphonic forms, such as fuguing canon, and those are the ones which J.S. Bach mastered. And then in uh, the subsequent classes, we'll look at two other forms that are commonly used in classical music, variation form and sonata form. And what I can say is, um, as I've mentioned before, I'm going to draw from my desert island works in the class, um, such as Bach's Art of the Fugue and Goldberg Variations, and Strauss's fantastic piece Don Quixote, um, and a healthy dose of Beethoven. So I hope you'll join me. I used to have a last name that started with a B, and I wish I still did. But anyway, 
My name is Karen Stanford, and I work at Mission San Luis. I love Mission San Luis. I love museums. And I think they're a vehicle for getting our messages across in terms of uh, culturation, basically, how people get along, how they don't get along. You heard a little bit about the history of the missions, about you know, being uh, killed by the Creeks and the uh, uh, British. But, I mean, there are a lot more better stories that are uh, not... They're small stories. They're stories about people. And that's what we do at San Luis. And I won't be the only instructor in this class. The whole mission community is going to be participating. The woman who does the cooking at the Sandwich House is going to be there. She'll be teaching us some hands-on techniques. There'll be a lot of hands-on. It's a living history museum. So I think that what you want is something that just really connects you with the history in a very uh, personal way. Uh, we're getting ready to celebrate, uh, in 2013, the 500th an anniversary of the founding of Maryland. And uh, so we can tell those people up in Virginia and uh, Plymouth Plantation that they were at first, we were. So two, two cultures lived together on the hill, the Appalachian Indians and uh, the Spaniards. And then they intermarried and they had families together. And basically, uh, the stories of their everyday lives are what I think are interesting to people, how you connect with them. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity, and I uh, hope you come out to the mission. Our courses are going to be taught at the mission. Good afternoon, everybody. I had a boss who said the mind can absorb what the rear can endure. And I look around the room, and I see that the rear is enduring. Besides which, Terry said, keep it short. Uh, six dark shadows is an exploration of events in American history that are not usually taught or discussed. Lois and I want you to know that Dark Shadows is not a lecture course. Each week is a participatory discussion. Each session will have an outstanding set of class notes prepared by Lois, and each session will have a video presentation to enhance and illuminate the written material. Therefore, we hope those of you who choose Dark Shadows come prepared to actively participate in each week's discussions. Let me close by thanking Deborah and Terry and Tiffany and Marlene and all the volunteers and staff for their hard work and dedication on behalf of all of us here today for putting this program on. Thank you. Hello, I'm Katya Taylor, and I will be offering the life stories and haiku poetry blend on, uh, at Westminster Oaks on Thursdays in October. This marks my 30th year of teaching life stories and haiku to people from all walks of life. But why do I continue to do so after 30 years? because I never tire of the stories and poems of my students, the literature of humanity, and the intimacy that is created when people write together. In this class, there's no way to do it wrong. All we have to do is let the muse guide us into our own unique way of telling our stories and writing our enchanting poetry. Sharing our work with each other is a wonderful way to see both our individuality and the way as human beings we share so much of a joint humanity. We all have our happy and sad memories, things we love and things we dislike, accomplishments, struggles, and hopes. When we write haiku poetry, the ancient Japanese form, we will discover the extraordinary in the commonplace. In just three lines, we will find the heart of an image, an emotion, a moment. It is never too soon or too late to write our life stories and create our beautiful poetry. Join us at Westminster Oaks this fall to experience your own creative journey with the pen. Thank you. Hello I'm, hello, I'm Michael Trammell. This is my second time teaching a literature course for Ollie. I'm really looking forward to it. I'll be, I'll be teaching the great plays of Tennessee Williams and 
Oddly enough, recently, I was glad or interested, kind of interested to discover that I too, like uh, Blanche Dubois and Streetcar Named Desire, was lucky enough to rely on the kindness of strangers after I was sideswiped in London and was laid out on the street with a broken hip. I had about a dozen bystanders. The British people are very nice after all. They're not as uptight and uh, unkind as sometimes the stereotype goes. They had a dozen people surround me, help me out, uh, lift me up get me on a chair, even, you know, try to put a blanket around me. It was rainy and cold. And one person let me borrow their cell phone so I could call my daughter. We only had one phone we were sharing between my wife, daughter, and I. And so I got my daughter there to comfort me a little bit. And you know, she's still a teenager. She's got a little bit of a wry sense of humor. So as she was comforting me, she told me, well, you know, Dad, it sounds like you, you broke your hip, you know, your upper part of your femur. You're, you're in a really a whole ton of pain. And I just want to, you know, to kind of let you know that Breaking your leg, breaking your femur, is the closest the guy will come to the pain of giving childbirth. <laughs> so, of course, I had a brand new appreciation for women. And, of course, all the heroines in Tennessee Williams plays, who goes through intense psychological, emotional pain, uh, especially Blanche Dubois, arguably. So we're going to go through uh, his, his major plays, Tennessee Williams' major plays, uh, Streetcar Named Desire, of course, uh, Glass, Glass Menagerie, and uh, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. And we'll look at those uh, heroines especially and how I have to deal with the conflicts of the new genteel South that they're from and conflicts of kind of the, the new South, which is more kind of Yankee influenced, right? A little bit. So we'll, we'll take a look at that and religious themes and, and other different interesting aspects of the plays. Uh, we'll do discussion. We will probably watch a few brief moments from film clips based on the plays. We'll probably take a few volunteer actors to maybe at least read a few lines from a few moments from the, from the plays and, and maybe get up and do a little acting in front of the class. No pressure. All volunteers. But it, it'll be great. It'll be a lot of fun. And I hope to see you all out there uh, at the class in October. Take care. Thank you.